So, uh, good morning and uh, welcome back, everyone. Uh, and thank you to Chaisin for inviting me to chair this session. I had the privilege of uh, visiting the Chaisin office in Beijing a few years ago. And uh, I must say I was very impressed with what I saw and the journalism that they do. So it's a great pleasure and a privilege for me to moderate this panel on China Plus One. You've been introduced uh, to the speaker, so I will not repeat it. Uh, Chaisen has organized uh, some sort of a poll uh, before we get into this discussion. And I believe uh, you will soon see QR codes which you can download on your phone and respond to that. And based on your responses, my panelists are going to uh, make their opening remarks. Could we have the uh, poll, please? We'll take a few minutes to do this. I believe there are about uh, four questions uh, and there are multiple choices. Uh, please take a moment to think through and make your responses. They're gonna be very useful. Okay, first question, do you believe that China plus one is inevitable from a commercial perspective. Well, I think the response is uh, overwhelmingly clear over there. I think we have more than 80%. Uh, saying yes. Could we have the Second question, please. What will be the main factors influencing the decision to adopt a plus one strategy? Oh, it's quite clear that uh, geopolitics is uh, the overwhelming uh, reason in most people's minds for going in for China plus one. Question number three. Considering the economic growth and trade prospects, do you believe China plus one is good for the rest of Asia and, for, and good for China. Good for the rest of Asia and bad for China. So there we have it. I think the response is that Overwhelmingly, it is good for both Asia and China. And especially, uh, you know, this response is interesting because uh, RCEP has now been ratified by every member uh, recently. So there's not a single country that's outstanding. So it's very interesting to see this response. Thank you for that. Number four, please. Can ASEAN take over China's position as the world's factory? <laughs> well, I think that response is also fairly clear. And uh, 
All the more because just this morning, uh, my sister publication, the uh, Business Times, had a story saying that uh, FDI into ASEAN last year was $200 billion. That's quite a large number, it's, you know, unprecedented. And the last 10 years, uh, FDI into ASEAN has doubled. So that's quite, uh, so let's uh, use the poll as, uh, you know, as a peg to get into our opening remarks. Uh, Wendy, have you seen what the people here think about uh, what's happening around them? You've just flown in from the United States. Can I just start, start by asking you, has the US lost its faith in free trade? That's a broad question, um, but I, um, I truly believe that our views on trade and, and the usefulness um, of trade agreements has changed over the years. I don't think this started with President Trump. I think it was building up for a while that our policy of, um, towards open markets and leading the world in the World Trade Organization discussions and just playing a leadership role globally has been questioned. And many feel, including many um, senior folks in the Biden administration, that when we look back on the history of trade, it, it hasn't been a pretty picture for all Americans, that many have been left behind. We've seen the offshoring of jobs. We've seen the loss of our manufacturing base. Um, and, a view, and the view now is that we need a trade policy that is more fo focused on the interest of the workers instead of business. But when I look at the responses you know, to this poll by the audience, just a few um, um, thoughts. Number one, um, I think the China plus one strategy is here, but I almost call it the China plus X strategy. I don't think it's just finding one other market to diversify in. I think many companies are looking all over Asia, including India, um, also looking at Mexico, um, in the previous panel, um, a colleague from Brazil was here. I think U.S. companies are looking all over the world and will be diversifying more and more. I also think the China plus one strategy also involves Chinese companies. They're actually moving as well. Maybe many were probably driven by the Trump tariffs to locate um, and set up operations, particularly in Southeast Asia. And maybe that accounts for some of the investment figures that you mentioned, um, showing booming investment um, going towards the ASEAN countries. Um, so when I think of supply chains, I think geopolitical, geoeconomic considerations are extremely important. But I also think a lot more is going on as well. I think Southeast Asian countries and India in particular are implementing incentives to attract these shifting supply chains, whether it be tax benefits or subsidies or setting up industrial parks. I think regulations and the investment climates in countries matters. Um, and I think the regulatory environment in the United States and particularly use of, of um, export controls and other restrictions and restrictions that are being put in by Beijing also are leading companies to think twice about um, their future um, operations. So I think we're going to see a lot of fluidity and a lot of um, dynamism in supply chains. I don't think the story is over yet. And I think, I mean, I'll just conclude on this. I think some of the data that we see, whether it be foreign direct investment data or trade data, we really need to look at those figures very carefully before we um, reach definitive conclusions. Because I think a lot is going on um, in the boardrooms of companies, but also in the capitals of countries around the world. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, just one more question, because uh, before I move on to uh, you. You know, if you read the Janet Yellen speech, you know, some of us felt that things were going to get better. Then we go and read the Jake Sullivan speech, and we think, oh my goodness, it's really not that good. And, uh, you know, last year, if I, if 
I'm not wrong, you nearly had $600 billion of trade with China, right? That's the biggest ever, I think. Now, all that was built up over 25 years of close contact and working together and all that. What are the chances that we could lose a lot of that? And what would it take to bring these two big powers, big economies, to something like, uh, you know, something like a, a working relationship again, you know, that set things back? Well, first, I would say I didn't view the Sullivan speech as running counter to the Yellen speech um, or the Raimondo speech for that. I think that um, the three emphasized different points, but they all had... Um, no, but I was surprised to see Jake Sullivan spending so much time on uh, economics in his speech. You know, you wouldn't have thought of it, but, you know, that, that did surprise me. For me, it wasn't surprising because I served with Jake Sullivan when he was out of office in the... the mm -hmm. um, the report that was produced on the foreign policy for the middle class. Mm. And I think the whole point here is that it's no longer, we're no longer in a world where foreign policy or national security is in one lane mm -hmm. and economic interests or domestic policy are in another lane. I think this administration in particular sees this um, holistically. Um, in terms of where we're going in the US-China relationship, I think the United States is trying very hard to send signals to China that we want to re-engage. We've seen meet, a series of meetings over the past couple of months, including um, in the economic sphere. Mm -hmm. And as um, we, all, we all have read, um, Secretary Blinken is expected to go to China um, in a matter of days. And hopefully after that, we'll see more engagement. And for me, I think that engagement in, in all pillars of our relationship is really essential, um, given that we're the two largest economies in the world and we need to talk. Mm. But the question will be, it's not just talk, it's also what can we do together going forward? And there, I think that both sides have a lot of um, um, thinking to do um, and a lot of consulting within their own governments and with their own stakeholders to figure that, to figure that out. Mm -hmm. And would you say you're how would you characterize it? Would you say you're moderately optimistic that we could get things back on the rails? I'd say I have limited optimism. Pity. Hyun, what is the view from China? And, uh, uh, you know, we spoke about the FDI numbers into Southeast Asia, and a lot of it is Chinese money. How is your strategy working at home? I mean, how much of it is deliberate? this uh, plus one that you, your own companies are following. And has it worked out for you so far? What has been the experience? Uh, as we have seen in the question now, uh, the audience have uh, give the number. Um, as the first question, uh, most people uh, agree. Actually I, I, actually, I agree with uh, also that um, the China plus one layout has initially completed, uh, not inevitable, but also, not only inevitable, but also coming to being. Um, but at the same time, for the last question, mm -hmm. we find um, around 80% of our audience agree that um, even the Asian countries cannot take over China's position as the world factory. So these two questions, uh, these two answers, I think, they are not uh, contradictionary. They are actually consistent. Uh, that is my opinion. Um, first, t uh, China plus one, okay, uh, now it's coming to being. But second, China as the world factory doesn't change the position. Um, since we can find China's, um, China's exports in the global market share, uh, now recorded at 14.4 last year. Um, but in the year of 18, I remember, it's only 12.7%. Uh, uh, so increased by nearly 2%. Um, it means that China's um, position as the world factory was strengthened, not weakened. Um, so there's another 
question of why uh, there's trade war between China and the US, there are global uh, geopolitical tensions, but why China's export market share increased, uh, even with the uh, situation of China plus one, plus three or two, um, because it depends on two kinds of speed. One speed is China's supply chain uh, out-migration. Another speed is more important, that is how fast is China's industrial upgrading in the domestic market. And uh, we can find um, there are some positive signals um, in many industries, especially in automobile industry. Um, China's export for automobiles take over the takeoff career in the year of 20. And 21 uh, take, um, oh, sorry, uh, 21, in, in the year of 21, China take the position uh, of Korea as the third exporters of autom automobile. And the last year, China take over the position of Germany. And this year, for the first quarter, China take over the position of Japan as the biggest exporters of the automobile. Um, but um, actually, China, uh, why China's automobile industry is so strong? Uh, it also benefits from the investors, foreign investors, not only from Europe, but also from um, America. Right. Mm. Do you see uh, a gentle reprofiling of China uh, among global investors in the sense that if you look at uh, Bosch, for example, they are investing in China for the Chinese market. And their chip factory they put down in Malaysia. Uh, Intel's new uh, chip factory is in Malaysia, uh, even if they might want to sell into China. So what you just said about uh, you know, China being a uh, factory to the world, and uh, you know, that, of course, you know, th those numbers for last year and year before all prove what you're saying. But going forward, do you think that could change uh, and that global investors could look at China only for China and maybe greater China, uh, but that factory to the world position uh, may have to be conceded? Mm, a very good question. Actually, I visited a lot of foreign companies in China, uh, based in China. Their strategy has been changed uh, substantially in the last two decades. Uh, in, the year, in the beginning of this century, you can find uh, that domestic sales uh, are very small and their export sales are very large. Uh, um, the export uh, volume is around um, like five, uh, um, 50, around 50 billion US dollar. But the domestic sale is uh, uh, like uh, only less than 10 billion at the beginning of this century. And in the year of uh, 12 or 13, uh, these two are roughly equivalent to each other, around one, uh, around one trillion. But in last year, uh, the foreign companies' uh, whole sale, whole domestic sale in China uh, recorded two trillion, and the export remains at one trillion. That means the foreign companies in China strategy has uh, established in China and uh, for China. Mm. Interesting, thank you. Jonathan. The PE space, and uh, you know, we, we are meeting here uh, weeks after Sequoia decided to uh, split uh, into three entities, uh, one for China, one for, you know, rest of Asia, and one for India. Um, what are you folks in the private equity space thinking these days? Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, there's an awful lot of money that you folks uh, manage. I think close to $600 billion, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, those are the assets you manage in China, uh, put together. And in your own case, um, I was looking at some numbers, and uh, I think your first two Asia funds, uh, half of it was invested in uh, China, but the second, uh, the third and the fourth Asia funds of yours, uh, has that percentage dropped? And what does that tell us going forward? Um. I think uh, the, 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 the data that you cited were certainly correct. Um, I think, however, the other interesting thing is uh, for our third and fourth Asia funds, the fund sizes increased substantially. I see. And uh, so what you're seeing is 
an increased amount of investments mm -hmm. in a number of other jurisdictions, okay. not, not a, a decline mm -hmm. in absolute dollar terms in terms of our okay. investments in China. Um, I, I think we, you know, obviously, you know, we, we are a global investor. Um, we look at investment, and, and, and in Asia, we manage a pan-Asia fund. So we try to look at investment opportunities across the entire Asia-Pacific region, including actually Australia and New Zealand. Mm -hmm. And what we try to do uh, at the very beginning was uh, to try to build a diversified portfolio uh, across different geographies, across different industry verticals, and over time. So those are the three levels of diversification that we try to build in order to build a, a, mm -hmm. a balanced portfolio. And uh, at any given time, in any given year, the percentages can be different, but over the life of a fund, mm -hmm. you know, what we try to do is to create some, uh, some balance. Mm -hmm. um, but to come back to the point, to the questions that, that we've been asking about China plus one, I think one, one of the interesting things that, that struck me is that it presupposes the China centricity, China centricity in the global supply chain. It talks about China still being at the center of the global supply chain. Then whether you're plus one, plus two, or plus three, China is still going to, to play a central role. And, and I think if we take a longer look uh, in history, I actually frankly don't think any country will be factory of the world uh, forever. <laughs> um, I think the nature of the global economies are changing. Mm -hmm. um, I think obviously China played that role because China industrialized in that particular period of time when global trade was probably uh, you know at a uh, the, the probably at the the, the most advanced. Mm -hmm. You know, trade barriers were coming down. Peace. Uh, you know, the the entire world was benefiting from uh, from a, a peace dividend. Uh, and, and I think there are also a couple of other somewhat unique uh, factors that contributed to China becoming factory of the world. I think uh, energy cost was very low, so that actually it made sense to ship Brazilian iron ore to China to be produced into steel, and then for manufactured products to be exported uh, globally. You know, I, I think it requires very low global energy prices, mm -hmm. and that was uh, the case uh, for a pretty sustained period of time. Uh, it required a country like China to be very, very good at building infrastructure and building manufacturing capacity. And it also required a, the, 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 the joining of a, uh, the rapid expansion of a labor force uh, that uh, you know, allows for China to take that role. But if you think about that, all of these things will change. Um, you know, labor, when, when uh, in the early 2000s, when people talk about Chinese manufacturing, it was all about labor-intensive industries where labor cost was really low. Uh, that's no longer true. I, I think we've been investing in China over the last 20 years. And, and if you look at labor costs, it's been going up uh, at near double-digit rates for almost 20 years. And so China is no longer a low-cost labor manufacturing site. Um, what's, what we've seen, um, I think, uh, pretty amazingly, is that China has been able to come up the manufacturing mm -hmm. uh, value chain. So now China has been able, is now able to produce more higher value-added products. But still, other countries, mm -hmm. Southeast Asia being one, right, ASEAN being one, is rapidly industrializing. So they will play a more important role in the global supply chain. So I think all of these will happen. These are, China is changing. I think we were talking to Wendy about this. You know, China actually, the services sector is becoming a more important part of the Chinese economy. So, so all of these things combined will suggest that actually going forward, we're going to see a more diversified global supply chain. Yeah, uh, Jonathan, if you're not giving away any uh, trade secrets, what are the most promising sectors for private equity today in China? Um, you know, we, we look at China, I, I think there are actually very, uh, a number of very interesting uh, uh, sectors. I think uh, energy transition is a very interesting sector mm -hmm. for investment in China. I think globally, obviously, we're all becoming more 
and more aware that actually the environment is a critical issue, that the way the sources and uses of energy needs to change. And China is actually playing um, a very active role in this global energy transition. And this transition creates very interesting investment opportunities. I think we talk about the, the fact that actually Chinese uh, value added uh, mm -hmm. in the global supply chain has been changing. So in a number of uh, manufacturing sectors, mm -hmm. it creates interesting, uh, a number of uh, very interesting Chinese companies have emerged that, ha that are globally competitive. Uh, uh, when, we, when I first started to do business in and around China, when foreign investors come into China, when they invest, I think Ravi asked the question, people were mostly interested in the Chinese market. You know, remember when Coca-Cola started to look at China, the dream was every Chinese uh, individual drinking a bottle of Coke. Um, for a quite some time, that actually was not, was not reality. I remember in 1992, per capita GDP in China was around $300. And so how much can you consume? Now China has actually, you know, is no longer a low income country. Mm -hmm. And actually, you know, Chinese consumption is taking place. So we look at a number of consumption related businesses, mm -hmm. including actually consumption of healthcare, mm -hmm. given, given the rapid aging right. of the population. So these are all interesting uh, investment areas. Thank you so much. Thanks for that. Chuck Leung, um, you're the only bank in Singapore with China, Chinese in your name. Uh, and I noticed, I was reading your annual report and you said your Greater China Business Office has now expanded to include Indonesia. And I found that very striking, uh, that Indonesia should be included in your Greater China Business Office today. What is the kind of advice that you're giving people who are looking at this region. I mean, you, you moderate so, many, so much of the flows yourself. What are we seeing? And you know, if you'd like to pick up from any of the remarks that you just heard, uh, give us the classic Singaporean point of view and a banker's point of view. Uh, I, I think I just want to clarify, China Business Office is actually an office based in ASEAN countries. So we are China Business Office in Indonesia, in Malaysia, uh, in Thailand, in mm -hmm. Vietnam, mm -hmm. to facilitate investments in right. this part of the region. So what we see, of course, is uh, a lot of uh, international companies, Western companies, Taiwanese companies, Asian companies investing in ASEAN. Mm -hmm. We also see a lot of investments from Chinese companies. Right. Uh, so and what sectors are they going into? Uh, the biggest sector for Chinese companies, we think of it in two ways. Uh, one is relating to resources, electric vehicle. Yep. Uh, that, that's one major sector. Yes. Uh, another sector is actually because of the very active and very dynamic industrial restructuring within China as a result of their higher cost of labor, higher cost of land resources. By necessity, some of the lower value added uh, production has to shift to some of the countries with relatively lower structure. Mm -hmm. uh, so for example, Vietnam uh, is a good place for Chinese companies to expand uh, because of the cost structure and because of geographical uh, proximity. So we see a lot of that happening. Mm. Um, one of the, um, I, if I were to digress beyond these two sectors, here in ASEAN, we always understand the need of infrastructure development. Mm. Uh, just now in the earlier panel, we talked about patchy infrastructure. So ASEAN countries have managed to overcome that by setting up very strong world-class ecosystem in pockets, in certain cities, in certain industrial parks. But there's still a huge need for infrastructure. Now, in what we are seeing uh, as a bank is that there's a huge need for both physical and digital infrastructure. So we see a lot of investment in the digital infrastructure uh, from, uh, I would say the funding come from the capital come from different countries, whether it's Western, whether it's Chinese. We see quite a bit of that in ASEAN as well. That's okay. Still have three minutes, and I'm going to ask a question to Wendy and then to Yoon. These are the people who travel the farthest to come here. Uh, Wendy, you work very hard on what we now remember as the TPP. Uh, it seems so long ago uh, when you think about it. Is that any chance at all, if everything you're trying in the United States does work, that the U.S. might actually come back to thinking of a TPP 
and uh, equally important for this region that it would not prevent China from its aspiration to join a CPTPP or a TPP. Um, so in terms of in the immediate, in, in the immediate term, I don't think there's any chance the United States gonna re, is going to return to the CPTPP. And I think if we did, we would need to seek significant adjustments to that agreement to update the agreement and to bring it more into reality with, um, with developments in the world and also in the United States. Um, it, at the Asia Society, I recently published a paper about 12 areas of improvements that we would need to seek, including um, um, attaching a new chapter on supply chains, a critical issue right now that is um, not addressed directly in the TPP. I think there's a need to update the digital provisions, which are about 10 years old, as well as the labor provisions, and I can go on and on. The United States is, though, very serious and committed to stepping up its engagement on the economic front in the Indo-Pacific, and they're doing this through the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, IPEF, which is not a trade agreement per se, it has a trade component, but it also includes issues including the energy transition, um, decarbonization, supply chains, and anti-corruption. And good progress is being made in the IPEF. Um, I know when I come to Asia, I hear a lot about um, the fact that while the IPEF is welcome, we sure wish the United States would do more and particularly offer market access and tariff cuts and go back and, and, and become interested in trade agreements. Um, I personally think if the IPEF um, is successfully pursued, then that would open the door for a next step in our economic engagement, which might get us closer to a trade agreement. But I think the days of traditional trade agreements, like, um, I, you know, I spent 30 years of my career pursuing um, are over for the United States, and that as we seek to up our economic engagement in the Indo-Pacific, I think we, we all need to just keep in mind um, the economic challenges that the, the region is facing, which frankly go beyond trade. What about uh, China's aspiration to join? Well, since we're not a member of the CPTPP, no, but the you do have States tremendous has, influence. Has no voice. Very key people who who put the CPTPP together. You you had tremendous influence in Tokyo, you know. And well, when I look at the direction of the Chinese economy in terms of having more state influence, it seems to go against some of the tenets and basic <coughs> norms and principles of the CPTPP. When I look at mm -hmm. the chapter on labor or digital trade, or intellectual property protection, or state-owned enterprises, it's hard for me as an author of TPP to see how China's trade and investment regime would fit into that paradigm. But again, that's up to the other 11 mm. members of the CPTPP to decide the United States does not have a voice. Got it. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yun, um, you know, we're meeting here uh, against the background of uh, Europe that has slipped into a technical recession. There's talk that even the US might slip into a recession sometime this year. And all this is bad news for, for us here, those of us who particularly uh, survive on trade. Now, China has announced uh, a f aspiration of 5% uh, target growth rate for the year. What is the likelihood that you will get that 5% growth this year? Uh, now it's really a rough patch for the world economy, <clears throat> not only for Europe, US, but also for China. Actually, even China um, realized the target of the GDP growth rate at around 5%. Uh, it's, re it's relatively high compared with other countries. But if you calculate that by two years average growth rates, since the base effect in last year, China's growth rate is only 3%. So the two years average growth rate um, 
is only around 4%. It's actually not so satisfying to everybody. Um, so probably the people will feel uh, the temperature seems very high, relatively high or moderate, but the people, the entity, market entities will feel cold. Um, so I think actually 5% don't need too much effort. I think naturally we can reach the growth rate. But actually, we need an even higher growth rate, like 5.5% uh, or even uh, near to 6. Oh, that's very heartening to hear. And uh, I think I have to conclude on this note. I'm out of time. Uh, let me just thank my wonderful panelists for their very frank uh, responses. Thank you very much. And thank you for coming all the way to Singapore. Please give these people a great hand. Thank you. <clears throat>